Welcome to the New America Foundation. Uh, I'm Peter Bergen, who run, I run the International Security Program. It's really a great uh, honor um, to introduce um, my longtime friend and a friend of New America's, Bruce Hoffman, who, as you know, is um, widely regarded as the leading expert on terrorism and counterterrorism in this country. Uh, he's just come out with a fabulous new book, Anonymous Soldiers, The Struggle for Israel, 1917 to 1947 with the provocative uh, thesis, does terrorism work? And the provocative answer, um, maybe yes, sometimes. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Bruce, amongst many other things, is a tenured professor at Georgetown. He, uh, he's the director of the Security Studies Program at Georgetown, which is uh, routinely rated amongst the, uh, the best in the country. In fact, uh, David Sturman, who's sitting here over here, is a graduate of that program uh, and also works at New America. Uh, Bruce uh, got his doctorate at uh, New College Oxford, something I share with Bruce since I was merely an undergraduate there, but uh, we have a lot of nostalgia for, for the place. Um, and uh, he set up the, <coughs> he was the founding director of the uh, Center for the Study of Terrorism at St. Andrews in Scotland. He's had senior position, he ran RAND in Washington. Uh, he's had an extraordinary career. Uh, so he's going to talk to us for about 20 minutes. Uh, about uh, the big themes and stories of, of his book, and then we'll throw it open to a discussion. Great. Now, do you want me to sit or stand? Whatever you're most comfortable with. Uh, it might be easier. I might be faster if I stand, actually. Okay. Cause you should always be suspicious for, of people who don't speak from notes, because they generally then will speak much longer uh, than they intend. Thank you very much, Peter, uh, for the kind invitation uh, to come to New America Foundation. Um, I've known Peter for decade and a half. Actually, we met just before uh, the September 11th, 2001 attacks in August. Uh, and we met because no one would publish an article that Peter had written about uh, the rising threat posed by Osama bin Laden, extraordinarily. Uh, very fortunately, he came to, uh, came to me because I edited an academic journal, uh, Studies in Conflict and Terrorism. And that, in my uh, Prescience. That was the lead article of the September 2001 issue of uh, Studies in Conflict and Terrorism. So I've always been a great uh, admirer of Peter's, and I'm delighted uh, really to be here. So let me very briefly uh, talk about um, a little bit about the book. Let me give you some of the context, talk about some of the key figures in the book, uh, address some of the more controversial points. Uh, do that within 20 minutes. It's uh, Four, 500 pages of text, so mm -hmm. I will c heavily compress that and then we'll open it up for a um, for, uh, question and answer. Um, first, a little bit of the uh, context. Uh, beyond any doubt, I think the period of British rule of Palestine was a very uh, melancholy and sad affair. And one has to sort of step back and say, was it destined to be so? Um, was the mandate... Uh, preordained to fail, um, what undermined British rule. And I think this is a theme that runs through the book. The book begins actually in December 1917, where General Edmund Allenby uh, marches into Jerusalem, conquers uh, Jerusalem, uh, brings at least the southern half of Palestine under British rule. It's not for another year before he consolidates that control. And I think from the start, British rule was undermined by the conflicting promises that the British government had made to both Arabs and Jews. Uh, in 1914, as part of the effort to enlist uh, the uh, Arabs in a revolt against Ottoman rule, if you've seen the film Lawrence of Arabia, read uh, T. Lawrence's uh, Seven Pillars of Wisdom, uh, the British made promises to Sheriff Hussein of Mecca that if he would, if he would, in his tribes would join in the struggle. Um, Britain pledged to grant freedom to those territories previously ruled by the Ottoman Empire. And of course, there were two pincers. One pincer was Lawrence and uh, Sheriff Hossein's uh, forces that went up the Hejaz, conquered Aqaba, swept through what's today Jordan, and then converged in Damascus. The other part of the pincer was the Egyptian expeditionary force commanded by uh, General Sir Edmund Allenby which in a series of uh, stunning defeats after pre three previous offensives had failed, uh, defeated the Turks at Gaza, then at Beersheba, and then took Jerusalem. Uh, exactly a month before, or actually I should say not exactly, a few weeks before, um, Allenby marched into Jerusalem. Britain had issued the Balfour Declaration, which was in fact a note uh, given by the then Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour 
uh, to Lord Rothschild, a president of the Zionist Federation in the United Kingdom, whereby Britain pledged to facilitate the establishment in Palestine of a Jewish national home. So you have these two conflicting promises uh, from the outset. Uh, British rule over Palestine was consolidated. Uh, true to its word in the Balfour Declaration, Britain permitted uh, Jewish immigration as the first new Jewish immigrants began to arrive in Palestine in 1919 and 1920. This sparked Arab unrest and rioting swept through uh, Jerusalem. The following year, in 1921, there was more widespread rioting that, sped, that spread from Jerusalem to Jaffa, to Tel Aviv, to the surrounding communities. And in the aftermath of that more concentrated, uh, escalated violence, uh, the British um, decided to claw back its commitment to the Balfour Declaration and def redefined its policy for Palestine on the basis of something it invented, which was that Jewish immigrants henceforth would only be permitted to migrate to Palestine based on the territory's quote unquote economic absorptive uh, capacity. Uh, unfortunately, I think the impression that was created was that violence pays, that terrorism rioting could be successful in prompting a change in British policy. And throughout the 1920s, you have uh, the Mufti of Jerusalem, Haj Amin al-Husseini, achieving a fusion of nationalism with religion, which resulted in the 1929 riots, which sweep through the entire country. Um, and once again cause a very profound redefinition of British policy in another climb back of the Balfour Declaration. Um, Zionist pressure in London actually reversed that. Uh, this is known as the infamous uh, MacDonald Black Letter where the Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald then reverses his uh, colonial secretary and does not accede to the drastic restrictions on Jewish immigration. But nonetheless, the writing was on the wall that just the right amount of violence, or perhaps more violence, could result in a signal change to British policy. And this then occurs uh, in the final year of the 1936-39 to 39 Arab Rebellion, which was a massive countrywide uprising directed as much against Palestine's British rulers as it was against the Zionist enterprise in Palestine. And in May 1939, as war is looming in Europe and Britain seeks to be assured of a peaceful Palestine where it can redeploy the large number of military forces sent to suppress the Arab Rebellion in the defense of the co European continent and of England. Uh, the British government under Neville Chamberlain promulgates uh, the White Paper. The White Paper imposes drastic restrictions on Jewish immigration. In fact, it will only permit immigration for the next five years uh, and thereafter it would be made dependent, completely dependent upon Arab consent, of course, on the eve of World War II when thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Jews were attempting to escape Europe and the impending war and Hitler. Uh, this was a huge blow. The White Paper also imposed uh, restrictions on Jewish land purchase as well and basically signaled a reversal of the support that uh, had been provided 22 years before um, for the uh, Balfour Declaration. A small Zionist militant underground organization calling itself the Irgun Zwei Leumi, or National Military Organization, had, following the 1929 riots, split from the Haganah, which in Hebrew literally means defense. This was the self-defense militia that eventually evolved into the Israel Defense Forces. And it had broken from the Haganah to pursue what they believed would be a much more effective defense of the Jewish community in Palestine, uh, believing that the best defense is a good offense. Uh, and that they intended in 1937, actually, as Arab violence and terrorism escalated, they began to use terrorism or counterterrorism against Arab targets. Um, in 1939, with the promulgation of the White Paper, um, the Irgun uh, declared a revolt against British rule as well. And in fact, in the Irgun's documents, in their public statements, uh, they declare that something to the effect the Arabs are using violence and succeeding, uh, we will use violence as well and have uh, the, same, the same effect. So basically, I would argue, riven through the history of the British mandate, was the perception on both sides uh, inadvertently created that violence could influence British policy. And you see this right up until the end of the Palestine Mandate in 1947, when the most senior British officials, in lamenting their inability to control the violence that is plaguing Palestine, say that this is the problem from the start. We've never had a consistent policy, 
and both communities have always been persuaded that violence can be applied um, against the British. So that's a bit of the context. Uh, let me talk about a little bit about some of the um, key figures in the book. Uh, first and foremost, one of the most interesting figures, I would argue, is Avraham Stern. Um, he's interesting because he was a, a poet and a scholar. In fact, the name of the book, Anonymous Soldiers, uh, comes from a, a poem that Stern had written that subsequently became the theme song of the Ergun and then became the theme song, as it were, uh, sung very gravely of uh, the Freedom Fighters for Israel as the, uh, as, as the group that Stern led was formerly known. Um, he was a dandy and a womanizer, um, a dreamer and a zealot, who in essence turned his back on a potential, uh, potentially brilliant career as a classicist and as a scholar um, to join the underground. He joined the Irgun and then when World War II broke out and the Irgun suspended its revolt against the British and decided to fight alongside the British for the duration of the war, um, he refused to accept that unilateral uh, declaration and split from the Irgun, created his own um, uh, terrorist organization, hearkening back to the experience of the uh, Irish nationalists in 1916 when they argued that at precisely at the time when Britain was enmeshed in uh, or preoccupied with World War I was exactly the moment to seize control of Ireland's destiny, to stage a revolution and overthrow British rule. This was very much uh, in, in, Stern's, uh, in, in Stern's thoughts. Um, despite his grandiose dreams and uh, pretensions, I would argue that in the main, uh, the group that he created that eventually evolved into, was known to Jews by the Hebrew acronym Lehi, um, to British as the Stern Gang, um, generally had uh, a much more marginal impact on events than the Irgun did. Uh, the Lehi never had more than a few hundred uh, persons, whereas the Irgun had upwards of uh, 5,000 uh, persons. Um, but what's interesting is in Stern's desperation to realize this aim of creating uh, a Jewish state that went beyond the boundaries of, of Palestine and to the surrounding territory. Um, he was even prepared uh, to negotiate with fascist Italy and even with uh, Nazi Germany. Uh, this was in a period before the Wannsee Conference in 1942, before the uh, final solution had been embraced as Nazi principles and Stern's somewhat mad idea was to appeal to the Germans to basically expel the Jews from Europe and send them to Palestine where they would overthrow British rule um, and, uh, and expel the British from, fr from Palestine. Uh, it was just one of his many pipe dreams that was, that, that was never uh, realized. Menachem Begin is another um, key figure uh, in the book. Uh, Begin was born in 1913 in Brest-Litovsk, uh, a uh, backwater at the confluence of the borderlands of Poland, Lithuania, and Russia. He grew up in an environment uh, that was rife with anti-Semitism that made a huge impact on his life. Um, his father's own defense, for instance, on one occasion of an elderly rabbi whom a Polish soldier was attempting to cut off his beard with a bayonet, and his father uh, raised his walking stick and struck the soldier, which of course immediately resulted in a pile-on with other soldiers and policemen uh, beating Begin's father mercilessly and throwing him in prison, may had a profound impact on his son, um, who um, then went on to join and become a follower of Vladimir Jabotinsky. Uh, Jabotinsky had created what was known as the Revisionist Party or the New Zionist Organization uh, that was more capitalist-oriented than the social labor um, orientation of uh, mainstream Zionism. It advocated a very uh, muscular form of Zionism, an aggressive uh, form of Zionism. Uh, and Begin uh, grab it, heard Jabotinsky speak when he was 15, uh, joined Beitar, which was the Revisionist Party's youth movement, uh, rose through the ranks, obtained along the way a law degree from uh, Warsaw University, but also, and I think pivotally, um, went on, among other senior administrative posts, um, to also be the head of propaganda for Beitar. Um, in the 1930s, uh, propaganda was, did not have its uh, pejorative or negative uh, connotations as it, does, uh, as it does today, what we would call information operations or psychological uh, operations. And I think this was one of the keys um, to understanding the strategy that Begin adopted for, for the Irgun. And I think, and as I argue in the book, is really the, um, the seminal impact he had on the future course of, of, 
of revolts and of um, uh, terrorist campaigns. Um, Begin arrived in Palestine in 1943, um, and he assumed command of the Irgun. He quickly emerged as a master strategist and propagandist. Uh, his strategy was not to defeat the British militarily. He knew that that was impossible, given the handful of men at that time that comprised the Irgun and their meager uh, arsenal. But rather, what he sought was to use violence to undermine the government's prestige and its control of Palestine by striking at symbols of British rule. And I think that the Irgun's campaign was the first post-World War II or post-modern terrorist campaign, a war of national liberation, to use dramatic, spectacular acts of violence to attract international attention to a group and to its cause. And this, I think, was really Begin's brilliance. I mean, there had been terrorist campaigns, of course, for centuries before that. Most of them had been localized, uh, had appealed to the indigenous population, had been directed against the foreign forces or the opposing forces in that territory, on occasion had appealed to the capital of the, uh, of the imperial power but really didn't have the international impact that the Irgun's uh, campaign had. For Begin, the audience was not only in Jerusalem or even in London, but in Paris, in Moscow, in Washington, D.C., and of course in New York. And the reason that the audience was in New York is because Begin made a deliberate effort to appeal to the fledgling United Nations organization and to enlist the United Nations uh, support for uh, Jewish statehood. So in an era long before 24-7 uh, news coverage and cable channels and instantaneous um, satellite uh, transmissions, Begin deliberately try, appealed to an audience beyond the foot, uh, footlights and attempted to marshal international pressure on Britain. The Irgun had a number of uh, political front organizations in the United States that were um, extremely successful um, in fundraising, um, in seen resolutions passed in Congress uh, condemning British rule, and in many respects this presaged the relationship between um, the Irish Republican Army and Sinn Féin throughout the 1960s and 1970s and um, 1980s. Uh, let me say a few words about Winston Churchill, obviously someone who's well known, but in the context of the book, uh, Churchill from the time he was first elected to Parliament in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, was always a philo-Semite or a friend of uh, Zionism. Um, he was always an ardent opponent of the 1939 White Paper, despite the fact that it was his political party, the Conservative Party, that had imposed it. And during World War II in 1943, he came up with a plan to resolve uh, the question of Palestine's political future. Uh, he convened a special committee of the British cabinet that he packed with all of Zionist's closest supporters, mostly from the Labor Party, not from his own party. And they were charged with coming up with a solution to Palestine that would entail the partition of the country, precisely the solution that had been advocated in 1937 by a British royal commission, but then had been obviously scuttled with the 1939 uh, white paper. And his intention was uh, to hold the next Big Three conference, uh, not in Yalta, as it transpired in February 1945, but instead in Jerusalem. And at that conference, to enlist the support of the United States and of the Soviet Union in backing uh, his partition plan that would be enforced by British uh, bayonets. Um, there is uh, voluminous material, both in the British archives and in the Weizmann archives in Rehovot, Israel, that uh, attest to this. In fact, on um, November 2nd, 1944, Churchill had lunch with Chaim Weizmann, president of the World Zionist Organization, the future president of Israel. And, he, and Weizmann had asked him, I hear rumors that the partition plan that the cabinet committee is going to propose will not give the Jews a sufficiently large state. And uh, Churchill hastened to assure him that was not the case. In fact, he said something to the effect that you'll be able to stick your thumb in a pie and pull out a plum piece. Um, and he said, I just want to wait until after the US presidential election on uh, November 7th to, uh, to announce this. Um, so that we can be sure that President Roosevelt's uh, support um, uh, will be obtained, and then we can present a united front to Stalin at the next Great Powers Conference. And then the following day, I'm sorry, the day before the American presidential election on November 6, uh, 1944, two members of the Lehi gunned down Lord Moyne in Cairo. Uh, Lord Moyne was the Minister of State for the Middle East, 
um, was a person of cabinet rank, so it's as if a member of, of the United States cabinet or the British cabinet had been shot uh, by gunmen. Um, he was also a very old and close personal friend of Churchill's and a very close political ally that had stood beside Churchill at virtually every juncture of Churchill's career since the early 1920s. Uh, with the death of his old friend and political ally, uh, Churchill basically abandoned the partition plan. Uh, I would argue that he always remained a friend of Zionism, but unfortunately, uh, uh, this became a lost opportunity. And as we know, the Big Three Conference did not meet in Jerusalem. The Palestine issue was not raised at the conference, and we have the, uh, the events that then transpired at the end of um, World War II. Um, finally, and I realize I'm getting on to 20 minutes, so let me briefly say something about a uh, Palestinian Arab who figures prominently in the, in the story and then sort of wrap up with the more controversial uh, part of the uh, book. Um, Haj Amin al-Husseini was descended from one of the most prominent families uh, in Palestine. Um, um, he attended Cairo's prestigious Al-Azhar University before World War I, and even then had achieved some notoriety for organizing a Palestu Palestinian student society, um, opposing the Zionist immigration and land purchase in Palestine even before uh, the First World War. Uh, he was one of the chief organizers of the 1920 riots, which I uh, referred to earlier. In fact, a British military court sentenced him to 15 years in prison. He was subsequently pardoned by the first high commissioner, uh, Herbert Samuel, who also thought that perhaps by appointing uh, Haj Amin to high office, that this would moderate his more extremist tendencies. So he was appointed Mufti of Jerusalem, which is the senior uh, religious figure. Uh, he, in fact, styled himself as the Grand Mufti. Um, and he was also made president of the Supreme Muslim Council, the sort of preeminent uh, Arab uh, Palestinian representative body. It did not moderate uh, his extremist tendencies. As I said earlier, he was uh, involved, well, he was involved in, the, as I mentioned earlier, there was riots in 1921 and 1929 that he played a particularly important uh, role in. Uh, he was one of the instigators of the 1936 Arab Rebellion. A warrant was issued for his arrest. He fled Palestine, uh, never to return to his home country. Um, he floated around the Middle East, eventually ended up in Rome, and then finally in Berlin. And this, unfortunately, didn't make it into the book. I had, the book was actually twice as long as the published version that you see. And I have a very good editor who said, you have to cut it in half, basically. <laughs> so one of the things that I'm very sorry didn't make it into the book, but I found in the US National Archives in Suitland, Maryland, was a list of how much um, senior Nazi officials and functionaries and Hitler's favorite military commanders were paid. And I was amazed to find that Haj Amin al-Husseini was paid as much as a German field marshal was paid during World War II. So clearly his ties um, to, the, to the Nazis were quite profound. Okay, let me move on to wrap up and uh, ask what is one of the main questions of the book, and that is, uh, does terrorism work? Um, I've been studying terrorism one way or another for nearly 40 years, since I first went to graduate school in 1976. Uh, Statesmen, scholars, uh, any number of people always argue that terrorism is a failed strategy, is largely ineffective, um, is unsuccessful. And I've often thought, especially as I've watched over the past four decades, terrorism become an even more intractable uh, problem in international politics. Uh, as I've seen terrorism grow, become, if anything, more violent, more bloody, uh, in meshing civilians far more than it ever did in the past. I've often asked, well, if terrorism is so ineffective, why has it persisted for at least the past two millennia and become an increasingly popular means of violent political expression in the 21st century? And I think one reason for terrorists, terrorism's historical intractability is the capacity of terrorist groups to learn from one another and the ineptitude of most governments and militaries when confronted by terrorist campaigns to learn from their mistakes, at least initially, or to learn from uh, past mistakes of, of, of other military powers. So what, what one sees is that those terrorist groups that survive and indeed may be successful, if only in a tactical way, uh, absorb and apply the lessons learned from their predecessors. This was certainly true in the case of the Irgun and the Lehi. Uh, both groups studied intently uh, the experience of the Russian anarchists and the Russian anti-monarchists, uh, the people's will, uh, from the late 19th century. They both, as I mentioned earlier in, in Stern's case, but this applied also to the Irgun, were particularly interested in the experience of the Irish nationalists 
from the 19-teens and the 1920s. In fact, Itzhak Shamir, future prime minister uh, of Israel, um, who was one of the three commanders of the Lehi after Stern was, was killed by British police in 1942. Um, actually, his nom de guerre, his underground name, was in fact Michael, uh, in honor of or in reference to um, Michael, Michael Collins. And here, I think the Irgun had a particularly influence, a particularly significant influence on terrorists, um, terrorism's future uh, trajectory. As I said, it was the first post World War II struggle of national liberation to use spectacular, dramatic acts of violence to attract attention to the group and its cause, as I described earlier, to play to an audience uh, beyond uh, the footnotes. This was part of Begin's strategy, which he described as erecting a glass house in Palestine, with the world looking in, with the world riveted um, by these attention-garnering acts of violence, such as uh, the bombing of the King David Hotel and other instances. And, uh, and other incidents, but also he believed that the glass house would be the, she the shield of the Irgun and of the Jewish community in Palestine, that it would prevent Britain from resorting to many of the harsh repressive means that other states had used when confronted by wars of national liberation or by uh, terrorist uh, campaigns and would um, especially enable, and this proved to be entirely correct, that the British suppressed the Arab rebellion absolutely ruthlessly. Um, um, bombardment of towns and villages, collective punishment of communities, indirect artillery fire, really uh, uh, unrestrained uh, use of firepower. And there was a very, very different uh, set of circumstances in Palestine after World War II. It was largely because Begin and his strategy uh, fought an urban terrorist campaign concealed within uh, the surrounding community um, that also became uh, the shield. and proved, I think, you know, enormously uh, effective, at least, in that goal of putting pressure on the British. Now, uh, and I'll conclude here. History, as we know, is rarely, if ever, monocausal. Uh, there are a concatenation of events that often account for dramatic turns or changes in history. And in the book, I am not by any stretch of the imagination arguing that terrorism on its own that Begin himself, as I think uncharitably a reviewer said of the book this past week, and single-handedly defeated the British Empire. That is not the thrust of the book, and that's not what I argue. In fact, when one looks at the circumstances that led to the creation of Israel, first and foremost is the Holocaust and the, the final solution that, that, in essence, nearly succeeded in eliminating European uh, Jewry. Certainly, there was the pressure of the Jewish displaced persons. I mean, over 100,000 persons languishing in detention camps in Europe two, three years um, after the cessation of hostilities. Certainly, hand in glove with that was President Truman's tremendous sympathy, even against the advice of the State Department and of se his Secretary of State, uh, George Marshall. Marshall. Um, certainly, the patient diplomacy of the mainstream Zionist community was absolutely pivotal. Um, but at the same time, I think, what has often been excluded is the role that militant underground organizations like the Irgun and Lehi played in pressuring the British and certainly acting as an accelerant in forcing the British to leave Palestine sooner than they would have preferred and to leave Palestine in circumstances that they didn't uh, desire. Uh, again, somewhat uncharitably, the reviewer didn't uh, consult the footnotes. Against the conventional wisdom, one of the things I found in researching this book is almost until the bitter end, the British military wanted to hold on to Palestine for its future basing potential. This is after Britain had already granted independence uh, to India, but nonetheless, Britain was cognizant of the fact that the 1946 Anglo-Egyptian Treaty would result in the secession of British basing rights in Egypt. Britain was still concerned about controlling the Suez Canal and being blocked from using the Suez Canal, and therefore wanted to move its bases from Egypt to Palestine, and mainly to Haifa, because Haifa is one of the best natural deep water ports in the world. Um, even Ernest Bevan, the foreign secretary, supported this up until, and that's the huge turning point, February 1947, where I would argue, because of the pressure of the violence, particularly from the Irgun, even Bevan now is starting to think, this isn't going to work and is not, is not worth it. Um, the other reason the British were particularly interested in Haifa is because that was the terminus of the Iraq Petroleum Pipeline, uh, which flowed from Kirkuk and Mosul, and you can still see in Haifa today the huge uh, storage facilities. So the British wanted 
to retain basing rights. They envisioned something much like the Hashemite Kingdom of, of Jordan, which they created, having a friendly power there that would grant them those, the, those rights. I think what the Irgun did was deprive Brit Britain of that opportunity of that, uh, of, of, to, to um, dispose of Palestine in a way that would result in a unitary state and a majority um, Arab state. And this becomes very clear in the correspondence of the, of the colonial secretary at the time, Arthur Creech Jones, who specifically makes um, exactly um, these points. So let me stop there. I've gone on far too long. It's probably That's enough to talk about. So, so is, the, is the scholarly consensus now that um, terrorism does work if it's allied to a sort of nationalist, uh, anti-colonial insurgency where a democratic power is susceptible to public opinion? Well, in the long term and perhaps strategically, and especially in the, in the, at the twilight of the colonial era, that I think was, was very much the case. Um, I think because no country likes to say they were created in part by terrorist violence, that it mm -hmm. is something that's viewed as pejorative, that often that is erased from the historical narrative. Um, also, many countries, and I would argue Israel not least, is very susceptible to, um, to, uh, to acknowledging that claim for fear of inspiring and motivating others similarly uh, to use violence. Where I think terrorism has offered figured to an extent that isn't necessarily appreciated, this is a, a fulminate or a catalyst for wider conflict. I mean, there's counterfactuals. We can, you know, who knows whether Churchill's plan would have worked? Although, when you think about it, Arab, the Arab, uh, Palestine's Arab population had been broken by the three years of rebellion, which was as much an internecine fratricidal civil war as it was a, result, a revolt against British rule or a war against uh, Jewish settlement of Palestine. Almost all of the Palestinian Arab community's leaders had been exiled, including Haj Amin. Um, but yet the killing of Lord Moyne led to the ferment, and that's of course what terrorism is about. Terrorism is a strategy of provocation. It's trying to provoke some response or to create instability and chaos that at least the terrorists or their constituents believe they can uh, benefit from. I guess Abu Musab al-Zakawi blowing up the UN building early in the Iraq war is a pretty good example of it. that turned out to be a kind of fulcrum moment. Right. Well, I mean, look, World War I, I think, is a classic case that's, yeah. that really uh, dovetails with what I'm arguing. It would be, uh, even though I'm a terrorism expert, I would be a fool to argue that Gavriel Princip by uh, assassinating the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and the, uh, the heir to the Habsburg throne in Sarajevo in June 1914, single-handedly started World War I. I mean, there was yeah. the Anglo-German naval rivalry, there were Russians ambi Russia's ambitions in the Balkans, the decaying Habsburg and Ottoman empires. I mean, there was a constellation of factors, but certainly mm. we don't ignore the significant role one of many significant roles that terrorism played. And that's my, precisely my point in the book, is that terrorism did have a role in the creation of Israel. Now, there's another important point I said earlier, that propaganda in the 1930s didn't have the pejorative or negative connotations of that. No one uses the word propaganda anymore. It's information operations. I mean, back then, terrorism didn't, was not quite the toxic term it is now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the BBC, for instance, has a policy of not using the word or avoiding the word. Uh, I was stunned last month reading about the Taliban's attack on uh, the school children, 150 or so mm. school children are killed. The word terrorism isn't used once in the New York Times or the Washington Post or on any of the major media. It was very different in the 1930s and the 1940s. I mean, this word was used. It was used by the London Times, the BBC, the New York Times, the Washington Post to describe incidents of violence. Um, Lehi itself did not call themselves terrorists, but admitted that they used terrorist tactics. So we have to understand, I mean, in writing history, you can't impose, I think, a mm. contemporary sensibility. You have to communicate what history was about at the time and bring that sensibility. And that's why, to me, that's a less, much less loaded word than many people um, embrace it as. And that's one reason I think people often don't credit as being at least tactically successful. And yeah. you know it's tactically successful because it does attract attention and it does right. create crises that governments are forced to deal with. Right. I guess, you know, what's, what's interesting is that, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm imperfectly expressing it, but it's one thing to have terrorism to foment a civil war that just turns into a disaster for all concerned. It's another thing to have a, t a campaign of terrorism that produces an outcome which for many people was a good thing, which is the state of Israel. Right? I mean, no one right. could say that the civil war that embroiled Iraq, right. it benefited no one. 
Well, I mean, I think terrorism on its own never achieves these strategic ends. It's always in tandem or in concert with other activities. I mean, yeah. Sinn Féin is the most popular political party in Northern Ireland now. Um, would it have gotten there without the IRA? I'm not so sure, but certainly it was also Jerry Adams' willingness to negotiate with the British. It was the decommissioning um, that played a factor as well. The King David Hotel, the attack, was obviously the kind of, was that, was that the fulcrum moment where the British sort of said, hey, this may be worth, I mean, I know that the two armies, the two British army soldiers who were killed in 47. Right. But that, the King David Hotel attack preceded that, right? Yes. Um, well, the hangings of the two, two sergeants, these were two field intelligence sergeants that were kidnapped by the Irgun as a threat. Uh, three Irgunists were threatened, uh, not threatened, were sentenced to, uh, to execution. And the Irgun threatened that if the British carried out the execution of the, their three um, the three comrades that they would lynch the two sergeants. I mean, at the time, this was of the same as the, that Jordanian pilot being uh, yeah. enkindled and burnt alive. I mean, it was spread across the front pages of newspapers throughout Britain, uh, the tableau of these two sergeants hanging there um, in a eucalyptus uh, grove. It resulted in widespread anti-Semitic rioting in mm. virtually every major British city, Glasgow, Manchester, Birmingham, London, Southam Southampton. And that, I think, became a very decisive moment. Again, terrorism is a strategy of provocation. Mm. We see it with the beheading of James Foley, provoking the United States to intervene. So the King David occurred um, 13 months before. And that, I think, was probably a turning point. But it was still in the, I think the campaign was still gathering momentum. It was a turning point because the British military a month before had, um, had requested permission for a major military operation that targeted uh, mostly the uh, elected Jewish representatives in Palestine, uh, the representatives of the Jewish agency. Uh, 2,700 persons were arrested and interned. Um, ironically, by striking at the moderates, uh, the British were deluded into thinking this would somehow break the back of the militants. Uh, mm. Part of the response was the blowing up of the King David Hotel, I want to emphasize. It was not an ordinary hostelry. Uh, mm. Six floors of the hotel had been taken over by uh, the British government. The well, government just, Secretary just so, so was it, I mean, it was, was it, it, it was principally a military target, but civilians were killed. Right, it was principally a military target. British military headquarters was there in military intelligence, but it was still open to the public. Right. And 91 persons were killed, uh, Arab, Jew, and Britain alike. Uh, majority of the persons were civilians. And, yes. and I, I was interested in the, in the New York Times review over the weekend. Uh, outside the King David Hotel, apparently, there's apparently a plaque saying that there was a 25 minute warning. You right. say that's total nonsense. Well, the, there was, well, like many things, it was embellished over time. The okay. warning sort of grew in <laughs> length, and that's what's on the plaque. Um, right. The real question is, was there a warning, and was it communicated to the British? What's authority? the answer? Well, there was a warning. It was communicated to the hotel switchboard. Unfortunately, it was not 25 minutes ahead of time, so mm. the building couldn't have been evacuated. That's not to say that wasn't the plan, but I think just like wars are easy to start and difficult to control, terrorist operations are difficult to plan, but very difficult to orchestrate and to implement. And the warning was never communicated to the British officials. It's an interesting question because I mean I, I remember growing up in London there were obviously attacks or you know fairly frequently and the IRA did call in warnings. Terrorist groups don't do that anymore, right? No, no. Um, the IRA in fact had special code words, so the police knew that they were valid, and that was one of the problems in Palestine in 1946. Is there were a whole spate of telephone threats that were constantly being funneled into British facilities, to banks, to post offices, mm. that were extremely effective in disrupting normal life, but most of them were just hoaxes. Unfortunately, mm. that also played into it, where the hotel's assistant manager thought this was another hoax, and therefore on his own didn't communicate it to the British authorities. What was your research process? Because I know that you uh, accessed a lot of archives that had recently been declassified. So how did you go about it? Well. Um, I'm not a believer in oral histories. I think especially uh, you know, people's memories, even if you watch crime shows on TV, no one remembers what happened 10 minutes be before. So it was, I did do conduct oral, in, I didn't conduct injuries, so that was mostly for background and for color. Um, this was entirely, uh, it was research done in the archives, both official archives and personal papers. Much like a good journalist, I had two to three sources, often from archives in multiple countries for every fact that I have. Um, I used, made extensive use of 
every outlet in the British archives, uh, cabinet papers, prime minister's papers, foreign office, war office, but the most significant were the, um, and this is unique, I think, really in archives throughout the world, is that in recent years, Britain has made available uh, the records of uh, the security service of MI5, and that had a treasure mm. trove of, of information. Is that, that 50 history. years later? I mean, how, I mean when did, what's the official process? Well, in Britain, it's a 30-year rule, yeah. um, but then individual departments can elect to close archives in, indefinitely. Mm. Um, the release of the security services largely because of the work of Professor Christopher Andrew, who was yeah. commissioned to write the official history of MI5. And part of the agreement is that certain materials that he had read could then be cleared for release in the archives. I also worked in the archives in Israel, the Haganahs, the Irguns, uh, the Israel State Archives, the archives of the Jewish Agency, and also in the United States, uh, at both in Suitland, Maryland, and in College Park, Maryland, and downtown. You mentioned that the Ergun had these sort of front organizations working in the States. If, if that was happening today, would they have been charged with material support for terrorism? Well, I mean, this was a constant thorn in the side of British relations. And in fact, plays very significantly in Britain deciding in 1947 they did, to wash their hands of Palestine. I mean, Bevan, this was one of the fulcrums for Bevan. He said, this relations are being poisoned between the United States. Uh, mm -hmm. There were a series of demarches, complaints. Uh, Secretary of State George Marshall wrung his hands and said, unfortunately, there's no US laws that can prevent us from having the Irguns Front Organization put full page ads in the New York Times or the New York Post mm. soliciting money that they outwardly <laughs> say are being used for arms. Interesting. Uh, let's throw it open for questions. If you have a question, just wait for the mic and identify yourself. We'll start in the back. So this gentleman here, go ahead. Oh, I'm Steve Silverberg. Uh, I'm an attorney. Uh, thought I'd ask an easy question. What was the uh, role of the Irgun and the Stern Gang in the 48 war? Um, the whole issue of was there terrorism used? Were, were Palestinians pushed out? Did they leave? The whole right. murky thing, dear yes, said. In one minute or more. If you <laughs> <laughs> well, it was uh, you know it was sufficiently controversial and perhaps unwise to to tackle a subject where you know that firstly is asking is terrorism successful and s or can terrorism be successful and secondly to even label the Jewish underground organizations um, terrorists. I mean that's sufficiently controversial. Um, I deliberately stopped the book in September 1947. Um, that had nothing to do with avoiding uh, the topics you're talking about. September 1947 is when the British actually go to the United Nations and say, we've had enough of Palestine, we're handing it over to you, and we're going to evacuate within six to seven months. So I, so I don't consider that period. In fact, Benny Morris has, you know, among others, has really, I think, examined that and uh, much more fully. Uh, I can tell you my, my wife would have left me if I had added another year to this book. <laughs> my children would have ran away as well, so that's that's basically. Well, how, how I mean, it really is a separate book. How difficult was it to cut? I mean, how many words is this? Two hundred fifty thousand. So you had five hundred thousand. Uh, well, a bit more than four hundred thousand. Yeah. So how, how difficult was it to cut, or did you feel it was getting better with the cuts? Oh, it definitely got better with the cuts. That's there's no yeah. doubt. And I had a tremendous editor at Kanaf who insisted on it. Um, it, it took me another year to mm. do the cuts. I myself uh, cut one hundred twenty-five thousand words. He then said, no, I said 150 and cut another 25, and it's much better. The only thing I would say is that writing is creating, and yeah. I enjoyed literally every minute of writing the book, because uh, I like writing. Cutting is killing, and that was absolutely wrenching. But <laughs> you know, the, the Hajamin story, that he was paid as much as a German field marshal, I mean, it's unfortunate that's not in the book, but the book hardly suffers from it. I think I, I had good advice to reduce it. I mean, the book was published when? Uh, last Tuesday. Have you had any blowback on the issue of describing what are, after all, Jewish sort of insurgents as terrorists? No, in fact, uh, the Jewish Journal of Los Angeles um, had, uh, I, I think, very balanced review, but of course that's you know, an author's code word for <laughs> an excellent and very effusive review. But he actually understood it, and he un oh. actually understood the interplay between, um, I mean, I don't even like using the terms, you know, right-wing and left-wing Zionism, but it's something mm. that affects is Israeli politics. And how about in today. Israel? I mean, what is the re what's the sort of recognition rate that, uh, that this, these events which involve terrorism uh, are instrumental well, in, their, in, their, in their birth story? Or is I that something that's sort of discounted? Well, I mean, 
firstly, the people who aren't terrorists. I mean, the labor Zionists basically were in power for the first three decades of, of, of the state of Israel and had a dominant influence on the discourse. Menachem Begin, the leader of the Irgun, was always, in, uh, was always in the opposition. I think it changed somewhat when Begin was elected prime minister in mm -hmm. 1977. But even still, I think, as I said, terrorism, I mean, these, uh, these types of terms are not terribly popular in, the, right. in, in a national narrative. And I think for that reason, even though there are plenty of streets throughout Israel that are named Lehi, Rehov Lehi, or Dakar, Irgun, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that you know, uh, named after them, um, generally the history is to put the emphasis on other factors rather than Begin and the Irgun. And, you know, it's caught up in contemporary Israeli politics. Even Benjamin right. Netanyahu styles himself as the ideological heir to the Irgun or to Jabotinsky's version mm. of Zionism. I'm not sure that's entirely true. I'm not sure mm. that Begin's son, Benny Begin, would necessarily agree with that. But I think a lot of the controversy that the current prime minister of Israel generates also impacts an impassioned or objective discussion of this period as well. Gentlemen here. I'm Dan Pollock. I'm with the Zionist Organization of America, a proud revisionist. Uh, I really enjoyed your book. I have to tell you that the cutting, I'm, I'm sure I missed whatever's in there, but it really reads hard to put down. Well, I mean, thank you. It's literally, so kind <laughs> literally hard to put down, so it really reads well. I have, it's fascinating. I have a, a question and then a quickie. I hope okay. I can get to it. The question is, it was almost news to me how weak the British uh, central ambitions, how, how weak their resources were in 1947 compared to their objectives around the world. You did a great job of covering that. Was there really a way for England to do that alternative strategy under any conditions, even if the terrorism had not occurred, weren't the financial, it, your book almost implies, right. even though you detail, especially the sergeant's deaths, that the weakness of the British Empire was such that they almost didn't have a go path to keep hardly any troops mm -hmm. on an ongoing basis. There. So, th and then the detail is, during the Arab Revolt, you talk about the flag of the Arab Revolt being raised over the old city. Mm -hmm. What was that flag? I didn't see any reference to what the flag oh. looked like. So that's the detail mm -hmm. that I don't know how to find that information. Oh, God. <laughs> you know, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was a black flag. It was a black flag. A little kind of like flag. flag. It was a black flag of revolt. Yeah, it was not the Palestinian Authority or the PLO's colors. No, I'm pretty sure it was a black flag with a Quranic verse on it. Uh, I don't know if I'm imagining that, but I think probably, I can't remember even where I, I took that from. It could have been Porath's book or, um, but if you give me your email, I'll try to find out. I'll, yeah, I'll try to find out. I think I, I, might, I may have it. Well, I mean, Look, one of the main problems is that there were still British soldiers in uniform serving in Palestine in 1947 who had been drafted before January 1st, 1944. So right there you can see the unpopularity of remaining in Palestine. Mm -hmm. Britain was weak and financially deficient. I mean, firstly, because the winter of 1947 had been a terrible winter, and, and British economy came to a, a, a standstill. I mean, the stuff in Washington that, that drives us to a standstill. I mean, you read about that winter, it was extremely harsh. Um, so, and also, Britain had secured a very large loan from the United States at the end of World War II. And unfortunately, the balance of payments deficit meant that it had eroded considerably Britain's buying power very quickly and much more suddenly than had been anticipated. So all that played into it. I also have to say, too, is that as in all imperial ventures, as we know from Jay Hobson's study of imperialism, it wasn't, you know, it was, e there was an economic foundation to imperialism. And part of that was having very small colonial police forces everywhere. So the British always tried to do these things on the cheap and because they had an inadequate police force, both in numbers and in quality. I mean, that was also one of the reasons that Palestine successively was very quickly submerged in violence and the military had to be called out. But the point is, I mean, this is the interesting thing. I mean, Britain stayed in Malaya for uh, 14 years, uh, 12 years, sorry, from 1948 to 1960. Even with the Mau Mau Rebellion in um, Kenya, it stayed there in four years. In Cyprus, it stayed, there for, it stayed there for six years. It very reluctantly left Aden in 1963. So Britain was intent wherever it could because this was part of its stature, especially at the end of World War II when it was being elbowed aside as a superpower, but still had pretensions as being a great power, and also wanted to constantly demonstrate, especially to its American allies, that the British military, though smaller, could punch above its weight. 
So there was this intention, despite you know, its economic decline, to try to hold on everywhere. This, I think, is where it becomes very important, where the Irgun acted as this enormous accelerant and really deprived the British, tied down their troops, made it very costly and expensive. I mean, as all terrorist groups do, waging a war of, a war of attrition. And that, again, this pushed Britain, as Creech Jones argues in the book, pushed push Britain at the end to this decision that was uh, precipitous on their part. I mean, they had actually one thing too. When they had gone to the United Nations, when they first discussed this in the cabinet in February 1947, they said, we'll refer to the UN, but if we're not happy with what we, they decide, we'll hold on to Palestine. By September 1947, they handed the whole thing and they said, we want no part of it. Mm -hmm. That, I think, is significant. You have to understand. You know, that's the thing about the book, as you know. The first six chapters, 1917 to 1939. The next six, basically about World War II. The final 10, document in detail those last three years to show the impact that terrorism or that violence had. You know, two of the most intractable problems in the world are birthed by the British, which is the Israel-Palestinian problem and the Pakistan-India problem over Kashmir. I mean, to what extent were the British responsible? Because they do, it does seem, from what you're saying, from what I know of the, of the, of the history, that they kind of washed their military, really, yeah. sort of just said, they sort of threw up their hands and said, we're, we're just out of here. Well, that was, that was very much Prime Minister Clement Attlee's attitude that, look, we declared our intentions in India, we left. I mean, unfortunately, there's been this bloodshed, but we're done with it. Um, that was somewhat the hope in Palestine, and then the expectation that the Arabs would be successful in that. Britain then could have the kinds of treaty negotiations that, uh, that, that they wanted, but it was this idea that we'll leave it to them to fight it out. Mm. Um, at one point, I mean, uh, being a bit unfair, there, and, condensing a lot of history, but when the Labor Party came to power in 1945 under Attlee and Bevan, there was this very concerted effort to enlist the United States to resolve the Palestine problem, mm. even to get the United States to commit troops to a lasting political solution. And it was the Anglo-American Committee. But the United States saw that this problem was intractable and wanted no part of it. And Britain was really left, I mean, when they realized they couldn't get the cooperation and support of the United States and Palestine, um, that also, of course, had a huge impact on, on, on British decision to remain in Palestine. Was Netanyahu's father part of any of this? Yes. I mean, he was uh, a revisionist Zionist, had been active in Zionist politics. He, he doesn't figure in, in the book at all because he didn't come across my screen. That's right, of course. Okay. It was Jabotinsky's personal secretary when Jabotinsky came to the United States. That's absolutely, because Jabotinsky right. died in the United States in 1940 in upstate New York, so he was his personal secretary. Gentleman over here in the back. Thank you, uh, Matthew Hogan, no special affiliation. Uh, to uh, bring my tribe into it a little bit. Um, That's my the question Irish tribe? My tribe is the Irish. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And the, uh, I believe the Palestine police had a large constituent membership that came from like the black and tans and the other Anti, uh, those used that were used against the Irish in the 1920s period. And then they were used against the Arabs in the, and so on and so forth. Second question is sort of not quite related though, is that a lot of the, Brit I believe a lot of the British, um, people like Catling and others and Gurney, ended up in Malaya, and Catling ended up being a friend of Jomo Kenyatta. And, uh, right. and they actually took their knowledge from that experience and, and used it in the future uh, decolonization things. Okay. Uh, sorry for two well, questions. You know your history. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to read the book, but you're absolutely you're absolutely right. I also wrote a right. paper on Dare You Seen, but it's another story. <laughs> right. Um, the, uh, the Black and Tans, which were the in infamous uh, uh, yes. auxiliary police or paramilitary organization that was uh, enlisted to uh, uh, suppress uh, the Irish uh, rebellion, in mass uh, were brought to Palestine and formed mm. the backbone I of the Palestine police so. force. In fact, uh, there's an expression in England, maybe you knew it growing up, duffing someone up, mm. which means sort of boxing them around the ears. That's derived from someone named Douglas Duff, <laughs> who was a member of the Black and Tans and then was a Palestine policeman who wrote uh, both a novel and also a memoir of his time there. Oh. In his memoir, he describes uh, the waterboarding of Arab rebels during, or Arab terrorists during the, the Arab rebellion and states how that was the kind of messy work that they left to Arab police officers and they stood behind a screen and then hmm. questioned the hapless uh, victim. And then you're absolutely right, Palestine Police Force, uh, the, inspe the last Inspector General was William Nicole Gray, becomes the Inspector General in Malaya. Hmm. Many of the Palestine Police Officers, including Catling, the Chief Secretary was Sir Henry Gurney, becomes the High Commissioner. 
Not surprisingly, the first four years of the Malaya emergency are a complete debacle. They mm. use many of the same tactics. They don't learn from the same mistakes. They basically apply things from the Arab rebellion that were applied to the Jewish revolt that then are applied in Malaya. And it's only when General Sir Har Harold Briggs and then General uh, S uh, Sir Gerald Templer take over and have a very different approach that the British finally, in the early 1950s, become successful. And of course, Gurney is tragically killed by terrorists in Malaya. And, and Templer's approach, I mean, it's not as sort of touchy-feely as some have described it, right? Wasn't there a lot of sort of forced right. kind of moving of the Chinese population? And right. Well, and that's, that's part of, I think, this, this revisiting of a lot of colonial history that has resulted in documents that have become available only in recent years. Um, uh, I think what was significant about Templar is he understood that you, you needed a stick, you had to break the back of an insurgency or a terrorist campaign, mm -hmm. and this he ably did. But he also, on the other hand, understood that you had to have lots of carrots afterwards to prevent this constant cycle of recruitment and regeneration that sustains a terrorist uprising. Are there any lessons from history about how to deal with ISIS? I know that's a very big, difficult question. Well, the first one, I think, in, in this context is that uh, You've got to deprive them of the aura of success that is certainly yeah. attracting you know, upwards of 1,000 volunteers, one reads or foreign fighters a week to them. Um, you have to counter what they see as their, uh, their, uh, as their tremendous success in redrawing the map of the Middle East and achieving what only one other entity has been able to do, and that was Israel after the 1967 mm. Six-Day War, that no other country has been able really to forcibly redraw the boundaries of the Middle East since the end of World War I. So I think, firstly, it's like Templar. It's, it is a military solution, but mm -hmm. it has to be accompanied by the types of measures that are non-kinetic, that counter their narrative, and that prevent the regeneration and this ability to recruit and sustain their movement. If you kill Baghdadi, would it make a difference? Uh, I think, historically, decapitation strategies have very rarely mm -hmm. been successful. But in this uh, case, because of his particular claim, being the caliph and all that? You know, I think killing Baghdadi, my, my fear is that, I'm not saying we, that he shouldn't be killed yeah. or assassinated. Uh, it would be a service to mankind, but I wonder, given the deep and profound personal enmity that exists between himself and Ayman al-Zawahiri, mm. whether the elimination of Baghdadi might re bring to fruition yeah. our worst fears, which would be some reunification of both groups, which I think is you know, not entirely inconceivable. Good, very good point. Well, and look, Stern, <laughs> was, Stern was killed, and it did not stop Lehi. I mean, right. the group continued after. Zakari was killed, and AQI right. got bigger, right? Hi, I'm Ashley Stipik. I am a CTSPV alumni, and I just want to bring you back to your point about Aragon as the first postmodern modern terrorist group. Do you, did you feel that they chose this strategy of spectacular international attacks deliberately, and over a domestic audience for a particular reason? And what did you find in your research that m indicated this to you? Mm -hmm. Well, I think this is one of the things that's always fascinated me in studying terrorism, insurgency, guerrilla warfare, is that the best leaders often have no formal military training or very limited military mm -hmm. training. I mean, Begin, for a brief per period, served in the Polish army in exile where he was a corporal. But I would argue, because of his experience in what we would now more politely call information operations, is he very much understood the connection between, between violence and publicity and the use of violence as a lever to apply pressure that he understood you couldn't achieve an actual military defeat of the British, but that you could marshal the force of international opinion, that you could focus attention on Palestine, but also through these dramatic and daring acts of violence, um, a trit and weaken uh, the British morale or the will to remain in Palestine and cause, again, an acceleration of a process um, in, 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 in the Jews' favor. So I think it was really his experience as, as a propagandist that but where he saw this fusion that, you know, look, terrorism is described as violence as communication. I mean, we accept that as an axiom in, in, in the study of it. And Begin, I think, more than many other leaders understood that from the start and understood how to take advantage of modern news media. But you've got to get the souffle pretty much at exactly the right, there's a way, you mean like Bin Laden completely blew it, right? And right. Like it was the most widely viewed event in human history. It produced exactly the opposite outcome of what he intended. Right. Right, he didn't, so, well, I mean, so you have to calibrate your violence, which is what the IRA did. If you look at the, you know, they killed 3,000 people over the course of a, thir you know, 30 plus years, right? Right. The, which, is, which Bin Laden killed 3,000 people in the course of one morning. 
So, I mean, I, to get, I mean, I'm just saying, I'm just sort of picking up on the question. It's yeah. like, you have to, it has to be a very skillful, you can't overdo it. Right. right. Well, and I think that's why the, the bombing of the King David is such a tragedy, because I don't think it was the Irvin's intention to kill all those people. Huh. I mean, I write in the book, I don't think it absolves them of how, responsibility. How many people did they kill, do you think? Ni no, not, not, not the 91 there, but I mean overall. I think the, it, this wasn't a war of numbers. Uh, fewer than probably during this entire period, fewer than 300 people lost their lives in yeah. total. I think only about 147 British soldiers and policemen. So this was very much a very, I mean, that's the point. You know, I call it terrorism, but it's a very different variant of terrorism that exists today. There wasn't this fetish of attacking civilian targets, certainly. Mm. There was very much in Begin strategy, the very deliberate, discriminate application of force, at least against mm. the British, clearly. Um, and that's, I think, why, as I said, the King David remains so tragic, because it was inadvertent. David? Hi. <clears throat> Hi, David Sturman here at New America. To what extent were there external operations, external of um, mandatory Palestine, and even sort of the broader Middle East? And to the extent they existed, were they directed from within Palestine mm -hmm. or inspired? And then did they have a separate sort of effect, either good or bad, on the group's cause from internal attacks? Right. Well, it's a great question, David. Expect nothing less than a graduate of the Security <laughs> Studies program. Uh, so uh, thank you. Um, I mean, this, this is the interesting thing. In fact, one of, the, one of the chapter titles in the book is called Beating the Dog in His Own Kennel. And this is what British intelligence had learned from an informant in the Irgun that was part of the strategy in 1946 was to even accelerate things um, and increase the tempo of violence even more by taking the struggle outside of Palestine. And of course, in October 1946, the Irgun blew up uh, the British Embassy in Rome as mm. part of this campaign. Um, it had plans uh, to stage attacks in the United Kingdom. Mm. Um, they were aborted uh, largely because of the intervention of British intelligence. Um, as even Christopher Andrew points out, actually, in his book, In Defense of the Realm, the official history of MI5, that uh, you know, the same sort of paranoia and fear that Britain has now of, of jihadi terrorism coming, you know, being imported or coming back to Britain because of foreign fighters uh, was the same sense of paranoia that's very evident in the, uh, the Security Service archives of Jewish ter terrorists uh, infiltrating Britain and carrying out attacks. In fact, uh, there's a bit in the book where Ezra Weizmann, a future uh, defense and, uh, and foreign minister of Israel, uh, was a member of the Irgun, was a student at London School of Economics, but was also tasked with the mission of carrying out the assassination of a British general. Um, British intelligence got wind of it because he was from a very prominent family, even though he spelt his name differently. He was a nephew of Chaim Weizmann. Um, a British uh, detective knocks on his door and suggests that he return to Palestine. And he decaps and goes to Palestine, and the plot is broken. Uh, the Stern Gang did succeed in bombing the colonial office uh, on one occasion. So there were plans, and the British were extremely concerned about them, to escalate the violence and to bring it in a more sustained campaign outside of Palestine. Most of the attacks were blunted by British intelligence. I mean, British intelligence basically uh, were in, they were not so good in Palestine, but they were very good, though, in threats to the United Kingdom. Um, and, you know, so. Basically, they blunted this campaign, and then events happened that the British decided to surrender the mandate. But the, both the Irgun and Lehi were poised to have a much more sustained campaign. And as I said, there were isolated outbursts of violence that just, that just weren't, a, they weren't able to sustain and continue. Jonathan Back. Michael Novi, just an interested reader. Uh, it's beyond the scope of the book, but I'm wondering whether your archival research cast any light on the Altalena incident. On the what? Altalena, Altalena incident. incident. Um, it, it is, I mean, it w w is outside the book, but I think it's, it's the Altalena incident, for those who don't know, was a ship that uh, was carrying Irgun arms um, to Palestine. Um, David Ben-Gurion uh, had uh, said that at this stage, uh, all the 
Israeli under, all the Jewish underground forces had to fight as one, uh, that he would not permit private armies. He said that this shipment of arms could be received, but had to be deposited into Haganah arsenal, arsenals and shared. Uh, uh, Menachem Begin refused to go along with it. Uh, the ship was actually shelled while offshore in Tel Aviv. Actually, Itzhak Rabin, future prime minister of Israel, commanded the Haganah unit that intercepted it. The ship was sunk. Uh, I think what its significance was, and it plays into something else with the Lehi. I mean, firstly, is that after that, Begin, you know, basically joined the struggle. I mean, he participated in the War of Independence, subordinated the Irgun to what became the Israel uh, Defense Forces and to uh, uh, Jewish, Jewish command. He joined the government. He was always in oppos opposition. Um, Lehi, on the other hand, uh, refused to subordinate itself and in fact in September 1948 uh, uh, assassinated the chief UN mediator uh, to Palestine, a Swedish nobleman named uh, Bernadotte. Folk Bernadotte. Yeah. E e exactly. Um, and it's interesting what Israel's, the new state of Israel's response was to that. Um, the Stern Gang was immediately, Lehi was immediately outlawed. 248 members of the group were immediately arrested by the new Israeli police. They were thrown into jail and definitely charges weren't brought against them. In fact, the British defense emergency regulations that had first been used against the Arabs during the Arab Rebellion and then against the Jews in the 1940s were invoked by Israel to be used against what they saw as a dissident Jewish terrorist organization. And Itzhak Shamir himself uh, fled Palestine and didn't return until 1956, eight years later. And when he returned, um, someone who had formerly served as an underground commander, not, supposed, not surprisingly, joined the Mossad. Tell you. Oh. This is one of the highest ratios of participants, uh, questions from, from the audience that we've ever had. Oh, this, yeah, everybody's. Matteo Faini, New America Foundation. Um, you mentioned, well, let, let me go back to Peter Bergen's first question on what made terrorism effective in this case. If you had to reach a generalizable conclusion as to what the conditions are under which terrorism will achieve its objectives, what would they be? And related to that, you mentioned that the British failed to learn, but what is it that they failed to learn exactly? Mm -hmm. Well, I think terrorism is almost always successful tactically, because terrorism is a strategy of the powerless or the would-be powerful that is using the fear and anxiety created by their acts, the shock and, and, and abhorrence of them as a form of, of leverage and to attract attention to themselves and their causes, to thrust their cause on the world's agenda. And countless times we see how terrorists are successful. Um, also, governments repeatedly say that they would negotiate with terrorists, that terrorism is an ineffective strategy. Yet repeatedly governments throughout the world, uh, not least even the, the Israeli government, have negotiated with, with, with terrorists. Um, and have made, um, made uh, concessions. So I think that's on the tactical level. I think on a strategic level, when it can work, it's, it's a strategy of provocation, as a strategy to spark a broader conflagration, as a strategy to uh, create instability and chaos that the terrorists hope will, if not benefit themselves, but benefit the broader cause, or buy them time, or give them the leverage um, to, um, to uh, harness their resources eventually to seize power. I mean, I'm thinking of Hezbollah in this mm. context, um, mm. where it was very effective as a means for them to enable them to build up their power as they changed and mixed and matched various tactics from dramatic attention riveting suicide bombings to mm. then the kidnapping of lone, in, lone individuals. Um, so I, so as, this, as this strategy of provocation also to provoke a response from an enemy that the terrorists believe will further their own goals. I mean, I think those are where terrorism can be um, successful. And we see that terrorism has been responsible for at least contributing to the spark that set alight the world in World War I. Certainly was prominent in the buildup of the 1956 Suez campaign and certainly the 1967 uh, Six-Day War. In terms of what the British failed to learn, I think these are the, the, the this has been one of my frustrations for years, as, a, as, as, as I said, as a, as a terrorism analyst, is that those terrorist groups that are successful, at least those that are survive and often go on to survive for a couple of decades or even more, are those that are learning organizations and that do learn. Um, case in point, um, um, you know, was the Irgun and Lehi learning from uh, the Irish exemplar, other groups in turn learning from Begin. 
although I have no evidence that General George Grievous, the leader of the Greek Cypriot nationalist movement uh, in the 1950s, um, consciously studied the Irgun. Grievous's book on guerrilla warfare looks an awful lot like the mm. Menachem Begin's book, The, uh, the Revolt. Um, so there is this learning. Where I think the British failed and failed to learn, and I would argue that other conventional militaries have, um, um, firstly, the importance of intelligence. Uh, British uh, military in 1946 had only five uh, fluent Hebrew speakers in British military intelligence. The Palestine police force only had three. So obviously their ability to translate captured documents was fairly minimal, much less their ability to effectively interrogate um, uh, captured members of the Irgun in Lehi. Uh, because of this inadequacy of intelligence, uh, most British military operations, as I show in the book, were very large, massive cordon and search operations that mm -hmm. alienated the local popula population, that disrupted daily life and commerce. Because, as I said earlier, there was an inadequate police force, uh, the Jewish community in Palestine was preyed upon by both the Irgun and the Lehi, who kidnapped individuals, who extorted money, who robbed banks. The British were largely ineffectual at uh, protecting them from, from, from the terrorist organizations. Uh, there was, I think, a real lack of understanding of the cultural dynamics in Palestine at the time. And I think, and the bottom line is that, you know, we talk now often in terms of U.S. military involvement overseas as having a clear objective or an exit strategy. I mean, there were neither of those. You have successive British commanders constantly saying that we're asked to do something, do anything, without any clear political guidance. Um, and that, I think, also under, undermined um, undermine their, their rule. And, and finally, the information operations dimension. I mean, much like we see terrorist organi organizations today you know, making immensely effective use of the social media where you know, governments are caught, uh, caught flat-footed, they're just understanding, for instance, internet communications, and now they're presented with this, this, this avalanche of Twitter, WhatsApp, and so on. Um, the British were, ex they constantly talked about using information operations, but they never got around to it. <laughs> and they, they never got their story ac uh, across either. But just to follow up on Matteo, Matteo's question, it, so, I mean, we should make a distinction between uh, acts that provoke that don't really produce the outcome. Because, I mean, provoke, doing something, just sort of making a mess is easy. But the, the, you know, Hezbollah is an example of using terrorism that actually achieved their political goals. And the Agun, the IRA, maybe the, Algeri the, the, the Algerians against yeah, sure. the French. But these are more exceptions than the rule, right? Absolutely. I mean, they're big exceptions, no, but absolutely. the rule is mostly it doesn't work. Right. right. Well, and it's the absolutes. I mean, terrorism is not always a failed strategy. I mean, there are, right. except, there are cases where, you know, sometimes those cases have mattered enormously with the, the midwiving or the creation yeah. of nations. Um, sometimes they've compelled governments to do things that have played into the terrorist hands, that have escalated a conflict, or altered a conflict and turned it into an occupation rather than a liberation. And you, you're the editor of the Columbia University, uh, uh, you, you've, you're, what is the, what's the name of the book? Uh, the series on terrorism and irregular warfare. Yeah, yeah. so the one, you know, nonviolence also has actually been spectacularly successful occasionally. Right, uh, <laughs> the, the uh, Eric Chenoweth and Maria Stepnak's book right. that's in our series, ex ex exactly. Um, it's, you know, it, it so, so if you were the hypothetical leader trying to, you know, running the, you, you wanted to create the state of Bruce Hoffman in, in Washington, D.C. and Northern Virginia. Uh, would you advocate a terrorism as a tactic or nonviolence as a tactic to your troops or your followers? Or it, depends <laughs> on if I, it depends on my level of patience at the time. I mean, terrorism is as much about catharsis and yeah. striking a blow yeah. that the defenseless or the powerless is it is about achieving fundamental change. I mean, the point yeah. is that I make in the book is, is terrorism effective or not? But terrorists believe it's effective, and that's why it's replicated. And then it also gets into a cycle of uh, revenge and release our prisoners, and right, right. and that takes on its own logic. But one of the keys to terrorism, which also figures in Palestine, is the more pervasive and the more ubiquitous the British security forces seen in pa Palestine counterintuitively, the more powerful the Irgun began, became. Mm. And that was also very much part of the strategy. And that's why 
if you can calibrate that violence that you can provoke the government, there are 100,000 British soldiers and police in Palestine. Mm. There's a 20 to 1 ratio between British soldiers and police and members of the air. I mean, that's an astronomical mm. you know, force balance. Uh, there was one British soldier for every adult male Jew in Palestine. Mm. Um, but that was part of the Irgun's success, is that the disruption to daily life, the pervasiveness of what became a security state, made the Irgun much more powerful than it was in reality. And mm. that's, I think, why people use terrorism. If you, as a terrorist, can have better intelligence than your opponents to ensure your survival, because don't forget, Begin was never captured and never imprisoned. Stern, as I mm. said, was cornered and shot to death. Begin was never captured. Did the British find torture or waterboarding useful? Uh, during the Arab Rebellion, um, they believed it was useful. Mm. Um, they did use it during the Jewish struggle. And in fact, the, before there was Guantanamo, uh, there was Eritrea and Kenya, where Britain, a certain category of members of Irgun and Lehi that were not, they believed they could not be tried in court, mm. basically were hooded, manacled, shackled to the floor of Lancaster bombers, mm. flown to Eritrea, and then subsequently they were moved to, to Kenya, imprisoned indefinitely without charge. Um, finally, it was the Irgun's above ground support organization in the United States that eventually was successful in pressuring the International Committee of the Red Cross mm. to win the acquiescence of the British colonial office to visit the camp in Eritrea. And mm. when they visited the camp, they said that basically, superficially, people weren't being mistreated. They weren't being right. physically tortured. But uh, indefinite detention is a very bad. <laughs> that, no, that was exactly the key, that yeah. the indefinite detention, being completely cut off with any contact from their families, their families not really knowing where they were because these were secret detention camps. Mm. And in the high altitude, they found that these prisoners were developing anxiety disorders and high mm. blood pressure, hypertension. And from that hypertension, were developing heart arrhythmia, mm. and they were very concerned about the, huh. you know, the people in their 20s had diseases that then individuals in their 50s and 60s had, and condemned the British for it. History may not repeat itself, but it sometimes rhymes, is right? The sometimes, yeah. So. My, question, my question follows up this question here. You mentioned the importance of a terrorist organization if it's going to succeed to be a learning organization. My question is the British military. Were there people within the military, let's say senior leaders, who said, wait a minute, our, our approach here in Palestine isn't working. We've got to try something different. Were there those kind of questions? Were they just shut down? Or what, mm -hmm. to what extent was the British military an effective learning organization? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that's an excellent question. Of course, you know, our friend John Noggle has wrote, written a book that compares Britain and Malay in America to Vietnam and argues this. I'm not so sure that that's the case, or certainly not in the 1940s. Um, almost every British officer sought to apply the same heavy-handed repressive tactics that had been used during the Arab Rebellion, where they hadn't realized the fundamental difference between the Arab Rebellion and the Jewish Rebellion. Mm. Arab Rebellion was rural basically was supported by almost the entire population, was fought in the countryside where the full might could be brought off and indiscriminately. The Palestinian Arabs were not as adept at information operations as the Jews were, and therefore were not able to enlist international support to prevent instances, you know, waterboarding or bombing of civilians. I mean, look, there's a, there's a wide boulevard in, Haif in Jaffa that was created because in 1936 there was so much sniping when the British uh, in Jaffa port of supplies being offloaded and being brought into the interior of Palestine, the British, the Royal Air Force, basically bombed a quarter. They gave people 36 hours to leave their apartments and they bombed, they basically reduced to rubble uh, this, this wide uh, swath. Mm. So none of that uh, could really be used, but that was constantly this strategy of coercion is what British officers had advocated. Now. This is, this is discussed at length in the book, but very briefly, it was the High Commissioner, uh, General Sir Alan Cunningham, who had been a military man, um, and then the Inspector General of Police, uh, Nicole um, Gray, who had been a Royal Marine Commando and was familiar with irregular warfare, who decided we had to do something different, that using large sale troop sweeps of, of basically conventional forces that had acquitted themselves very well in the war against the Italians and against Germany, but really we're at a loss in an environment, an urban environment where minis, minimum or minimal force was enormously important, where not causing civilian casualties was essential. 
and they created a special police unit um, that was led by one of Britain's most decorated wartime heroes, a major named Roy Farron. And it quickly went awry. I mean, that was the mm -hmm. one significant incident of torture where they were so, again, none of them spoke Hebrew. So even though their mission was to trawl through the Jewish communities and gather intelligence that then could be used by the conventional forces, since they didn't speak Hebrew, they had no way of gaining that intelligence. Their idea was to look for very young members of the Irgun of Lehi, teenagers basically, who were deliberately recruited because if they were caught, they couldn't be sentenced to death. By the mm -hmm. end of the period in Palestine, the British emergency regulations had a very wide berth to impose the death penalty on individuals, but mm -hmm. the 17-year-old couldn't be sentenced to death. And they uh, seized a 16-year-old in Jerusalem named Alexander Rubovitz. And it's, this was one of the things that's, that's documented um, in, in the book, and that's from the British archives and archives in Israel, where they basically took him down the Jericho Road um, outside of the city and tortured him to death to get information, and then uh, murdered him and disposed of the body. Um, even back then, you know, without cable news, uh, this became, mm -hmm. this was revealed, its attempts to keep it, the British government's attempts to suppress it. It was just when a special United Nations committee was arriving in Palestine that the scandal erupted. And of course, further tarnished the British name and also ended the experiment with using perhaps, you know, new and novel means to counter terrorism because it had, you know, blown up so disastrously in the face of the authorities. Um, Farron was never, I mean, he was tried, was acquitted. Um, that whole story is in the book. Uh, he eventually went on to be the Solicitor General of uh, the province of Alberta in Canada. <laughs> and yeah, I'll, I'll see, read the book. There's also another story of his commanding officer, too. This is going to be the final question, Brian Bauer. What would you hope that uh, modern-day Israel would, would have learned, would learn f um, from its own birth or from its own actions since its birth relative to the continuing Palestinian struggle, specifically Hamas? Well, you know, one thing mainly that I took from the book is just the political polarization that exists in Israel today, and that of course is very much in the news at this, at this moment as the Prime Minister is here. I mean, it has very deep and profound roots that go back, you know, long before the establishment of, uh, of the state. Um, and it, it, I mean, and that to me is, is unfortunate that there have been, so few opportunities for modus vivendi or, uh, or understanding in that this debate has become so polarized and caricatured as almost right wing and left wing, which I think is, is, is completely uh, inaccurate. Um, to an extent, I think, too, that someone like, uh, I mean, this may be the most, I don't exactly say this uh, explicitly in the book, but this may be the most controversial thing I'll say, that mm -hmm. someone like Vladimir Jabotinsky, I think there's a generally negative view of him as being some sort of prototypical fascist, uh, which I don't think is at all accurate. I think that he was, in fact, a very clear-eyed visionary. Um, he was the one who argued that these attempts to co-opt the Palestinian Arabs to bribe them or buy them off by raising the, uh, you know, the economic um, uh, capacity of Palestine by contributing to a growing and thriving economy that as everybody benefited and profited, that violence would end. He said, this is not true. It's disrespectful. In fact, these are people who see us seizing their land. And this is why he published the famous article in the 1920s that there had to be an iron wall. I mean, we don't like to hear that type of thing, but he at least understood that you could never co-opt someone's nationalism. Um, so he was more clear-eyed, I think, than he's given credit today. And as I said, he and Begin in particular, I think, are vilified. I mean, Achim Begin himself, as I said, I, I certainly don't let him off the hook in the book for the King David Hotel. I think he really did want to avoid civilian casualties, but the fact that people you know, tragically died there doesn't exculpate him or the ear good. But nonetheless, I mean, as a statesman, he was a visionary. I mean, the Camp David Accords. I mean, this was you know, the prospects of peace for the first time began to burn bright between uh, Israel and its, and its neighbors and, f and began to crystallize further with the Oslo Accords, but of course now, you know, have really, um, you know, have really, um, have, 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 been, have been knocked asunder. So I suppose, you know, I, I don't know if there's any lessons, but I think it's a clear-eyed view of history. I mean, like all historians, I've tried to be objective. Um, I've tried to, you know, put this in the context of the times, I think. And I'll end here. This was one of the unexpected parts of the process of writing this book. I found it enormously depressing because <laughs> everything we see today between the Palestinian and Israeli conflict 
all the debates, all the dis dissension, the clashes between extreme nationalism, the clashes between zealous invocation of religious justification or divine commandment. I mean, all this was played out before during the, British, the period of the British mandate. Um, and um, even, and I'll end on this point, even before there was Osama bin Laden, there was Is al Dim al Qasem, who was very much a bin Laden esque type of figure. In his 50s, he left the comfort of his life in Haifa uh, to wage revolution, uh, to conduct a revolt. He lived in caves in the Gal Galilee. Um, much like bin Laden, I think we, we would certainly consider him a, a Salafist. He wore traditional uh, clothing from the time of the Prophet, grew his beards long. Uh, intensive study of the Quran as a political document as well as a, a religious tome that justified violence. He openly used the word uh, uh, jihad. I, so he was very much a bin Laden-esque figure. I mean, unlike bin Laden, he was tracked down by the authorities within two months of starting his revolt and killed. It didn't, it didn't take the 11 years that Peter <laughs> documents in, in Manhunt. And what's so interesting and is also so depressing is that it was his followers that at every major juncture uh, in the 1930s where the fulminates, again, this strategy of provocation, just when the British were gaining the upper hand in the Arab Rebellion, it was the followers of Qasem that spun the conflict onto an entirely different level, polarized or eliminated any prospects of any kind of uh, stability or resolution. And of course, uh, Qasem himself is enshrined in Hamas's uh, 1988 charter. And of course, the name of the missiles that Hamas fires into Israel or fired into Israel this past summer that provoked a war are called Qasem rockets as well. On that sort of slightly bleak note, thank you very much, Bruce. That was a brilliant. Uh, thank you. And Bruce is uh, he's in a bit of a rush because he's got to well, go and do another book event, but he's going to be happy to sign books yep. and buy books. And thank you. Thanks very much, Peter. Yeah, yes. Oh, gosh, absolutely. <laughs>